to In the Know with Cat Bobbinell. Today, I have my wonderful, wonderful host, co-host, Dr. Latasia Jones, aka Dr. Tay. Hi, and everyone. <laughs> today, we have Dr. Corey Burns, and we will have Marlon Napier coming shortly. But let's start with Dr. Burns. Dr. Burns is an assistant professor in material science and engineering at the University of Virginia, visiting assistant professor at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, committee member at Sandia National Laboratories, and practitioner in the astrophysics division at NASA. Welcome yes. to the show. Welcome, yes, welcome. Thank you for having me. I mean, that's a mouthful. So, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> So I, I think mostly I'm an educator. Um, I'm also a material scientist focusing on nanotechnology, which I think is one of the five pillars of technology going forward. So I think it's a very important area. Um, other than that, I, I very actively involved with idea coalitions. Um, and yeah, I, I do a lot of foundational work with, uh, in the community. Um, and a lot of science, a lot of science, a lot of teaching. So that's that's what I do. I can go on and on, but just to sum it up, I do that. And just for clarity, for those who don't already know, material science, when you say that, what, is it, what does that mean? And nobody meaning like me, like sometimes I don't know. So. Yeah. yeah, so it's basically the science of materials. And essentially what we do is we try to design materials from the atom up. So we start with an individual atom and we think about how we can start moving atoms around inside of a material in order to change the properties of it. And so that can change anywhere from what a civil engineer does in trying to figure out how to make cement stronger, all the way to what someone does in the semiconductor industry working at Intel or Texas Instruments, trying to see how much electrical current can go through a material in order to maximize its performance. So it can range from everywhere and also biomaterials. So material science is one of those incredibly broad topics that a lot of people don't know about until they get to college, and even at a lot of colleges, it's not really taught at. So it's one of those things that I definitely try to advocate for in the youth. I love that. Thank you. It sounded like straight from a dictionary or encyclopedia or web page or something. So I appreciate <laughs> you breaking that down for us. We also have Mr. Marlon Napier, who is an engineer working as an investor and consultant with project and process management. Hi, Marlon. Oh, we can't hear you yet. Oh, yeah. Um, I would just say, you know, there is a system settings button. Just check where your audio is going into. But um, thank you for joining us. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time to come in and talk to us about what you're doing and being a parent. So for both of you guys, this is Black, not Black. <laughs> well, we are Black, but <laughs> Father's Day, Father's <laughs> Month, you know. So thank you for joining us and being there. Absolutely. So for this month, we wanted to highlight not just Father's Day, but kind of combine that with our interest in STEM. So we're going to start with our conversations going from your STEM journey all the way to becoming a father and how you combine both of those worlds. And of course, it's going to be questions, me, just me being nosy. Sometimes I just want to know what is, you know, balance? Is there balance? for fatherhood and STEM and so on. So we'll definitely dive into those questions. I know, Corey, you're like, nope. <laughs> Your face is giving me challenge all over. But we'll definitely get into that. So we're going to start with, like, I guess, Corey, um, Marla, while you get your audio situated, Corey, we'll go back to you and your, um, your STEM journey. If you could tell us, like, how you started and how you've gotten to where you're at, because First of all, congratulations on so many things when Corey was, Corey and Marlon are both very big on working with some of my programs, my outreach programs with the kids and um, all audiences and showing, you know, their black excellence in STEM. So it's great to see how we were at the beginning and where we started career wise and our, our STEM journeys. I think, her, I think Corey, you were still in school working on your PhD when I first met you, right? And now you're Dr. Burns. So if you could give us some of your story and now let us know your STEM journey. Yeah, so um, I started out in Marietta, Georgia. I was born there in 1994. And I stayed in that side of Atlanta, west side of Atlanta, moved across west side for about 18 years until I graduated. And then I went to Valdosta State. It's a liberal arts college in South Georgia. Mm -hmm. I actually went there to compete in division two athletics and run cross country for the first year. Um, it was quite brutal 
uh, there were two days. You wake up at five, run seven miles, and then you, you, know, you go to class and blah, blah, blah. And then later in the afternoon, you run again. Um, I love running, but you, you always got to question how much you love it when you got so many other things to do in terms of being in school. Mm -hmm. So I ended up dropping that, and um, I kind of focused on chemistry after that. I focused on chemistry hard, and I was motivated by Richard Feynman. Um, the way I got into it is, okay, so Richard Feynman was uh, a theoretical physicist at Caltech. He worked on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos National Laboratory, and he was known for being a great educator. Okay. And so I watched one of his, um, his interviews, and someone asked him, if hypothetically I can eliminate all the scientific knowledge in the world, and you could preserve one sentence to get us back to where we are today, what sentence would that be? Mm -hmm. Gave that a lot of diligence, crossed his legs, rubbed his chin here. And after 20 seconds, he said that all atoms or all matter is made of atoms. And so I said, aha, that's beautiful. I thought he was going to say something about biology or where we've gone in the progression of finding a cure for cancer, HIV, but he made it fundamentally about material science. And that's what kind of sparked my interest to go along with material science. And so I started my PhD journey at the University of Florida. Um, I did a PhD in material science and within a nuclear engineering program, and I graduated in 2022. So I'm a fairly recent grad. I got the professor job right out of grad school. Um, and so here I am at UVA, the visiting assistant professor at Oak Ridge. I kind of negotiated within my startup that I wanted to expand my network, um, move my research direction in one more direction before I started full time here, officially, officially. And I wanted to secure funds before I came in. And so they were very uh, willing to do that. They knew that it was best for me and ultimately that would be best for them in the future. And so here we are, we're in this journey now. I'm a professor here. So that's my STEM journey. That's how I got to where I am today. Wow, that. that, yeah, that's dope. Uh, Marlon, are you able to, We uh, can you hear us? Uh-oh, I think he froze for a second. Yeah. Well, uh, Corey, that's an amazing uh, journey that you had to go through. Well, not had to, but you chose to go through, right? And that mm -hmm. you were able to accomplish at fairly recently to get your PhD. And so what were, what was you, what were you studying? What was your PhD on? So I was looking at um, the radiation stability of nanomaterials. Okay. And so nanomaterials are on the nano side. They're incredibly small. And nano would be 10 to the minus 9 meters. So we're talking about incredibly, incredibly small. Right. And even smaller than that, I was looking at 2D materials. So that's when you have just one single atom thick of a material. And the most notable one is called graphene, right? It's a single atom of carbon. And it really got its tread way in about 2004 when mm -hmm. it was first discovered. But essentially why it was so popular is because it's 100,000 times thinner than an individual strand of a human hair. And mm -hmm. it has a tensile strength to hold up an elephant. And so, you know, researchers were super, <laughs> super excited about this. Oh, I got to know more. You know, how can we revolutionize electronics and all these types of things with graphene? Right. And so outside of what the traditional person was looking at with a material like graphene, I was looking at what happens if it goes into a space-based environment? What happens when all these high energy energetic particles and stuff start to come in contact with graphene? How long will it actually survive? And what happens to its properties when it's subjected to this type of environment? That tells us like, hey, maybe NASA one day can use this as a, some type of device as they go towards in the future. Or maybe these deep submarine missions where the pressure is incredibly high can use this, right? Because what happens to a material when it gets all this pressure immersed into its surface? So I was looking at that. I was looking at high temperatures, low temperature, high radiation environment, high, temp high pressures, all this stuff, because we needed a foundational knowledge about what happens to this material. That's, that's the, the science. I love that. Thank you for breaking that down, because I actually I was going to follow up and ask you, you know, for those who can't see the big picture to that research, what is the applicability? But you're already providing it, right? Like you're finding out the functionality of, you know, the material and seeing whether or not it could be used or applied elsewhere based on the properties. And I love that. I love that. It's like the foundation, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So Marlon, I think we can hear you now. Are you? 
Yes, I had to do it on a different device. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I always so have a backup. Marlon. I hope you heard everything we've been we've been trying to saw a little bit too, but we've been deep in, um, we've been diving into Corey's story, his STEM journey, and if you can, yes. you've already presented um, your current STEM status. So if you could provide us yes. with your STEM journey and let us know, you know, how to, oh, from the beginning uh, to the end, how you got to where you are today. I know I've heard it plenty of oh, times, uh, but I think yes. it's a great story to always <laughs> share. <laughs> Take a sip on it. <laughs> Take a sip of water. Uh, so my STEM journey uh, actually began back when I was in sixth grade. So uh, a friend of mine named Randolph Douglas uh, introduced me to the family at the uh, College of Engineering. Back then, it was big looking at uh, the show A Different World, which is so important to see representation for us, uh, people that look like us in that space. And the main character, Dwayne Wayne, the man, the myth, the legend, flip up glasses, you know, uh, had a nice handle on everything. And he was an electrical engineer. And so for me, I was, you know, like that normal kid that wanted to take things apart, put it together, have extra parts left over, still work, you know. Um, and so I kind of started looking into engineering. So my friend Randolph Douglas, while well, he was in engineering school, took me to uh, the engineering school. And from there, I just fell in love with it. You know, I just knew that was what I wanted to um, set my journey on. So fast forward, I end up in the College of uh, Engineering, the uh, family at the Chief School of Engineering. And I was also an athlete playing football uh, at Florida State University under uh, Coach Bobby Bowden. Um, God bless his soul. And uh, from there, it was a lot of hard work. You know, I, I tried to embark upon a journey that I didn't know uh, not many athletes embark upon. Um, there, I learned the real meaning of student athlete and as actual athlete student at that level, at the Division One level. Um, springboard into working military subcontracting uh, was my really first big um, jump to STEM. So working with uh, General Dynamic Land Systems, working on the power systems for Abrams, Stryker um, vehicles, uh, some of the optic systems. Um, so that was really uh, my foundation of art. And from there, I just began to um, just grow my journey. So growing from there to emergency vehicles uh, down in Ocala, Florida, where I spent my time in Slocala. So the people watching from Slocala, just, uh, I'm putting them shouting you out, uh, E1 where um, we did a lot of emergency vehicles. And so that's where I got my first hat at being a project manager. There was in the PMO office. It was, you're the engineer, you're also the project manager over your line. And we're selling these trucks. And if it's uh, dealing with the Department of Defense and it's your truck line, it's you cradle the grave. So that really got my feet wet into what I'm doing now. And then now fast forward, uh, a few companies later, a couple military subcontracting and my manufacturing companies. I uh, went into some different spaces in engineering. So uh, process engineering, quality engineering, health and safety engineering. Um, uh, of course, now project management and uh, process management. So that's kind of what gets me into this space now. Now I'm in the consulting part and the investment part is actually uh, me looking to uh, purchase a company. Um, so that's the, the other space of it that I'm still working in. I'm still doing the consulting work, but now it's also looking to not be just the uh, person doing the work, but also the person being able to own the companies and provide, you know, um, opportunity for younger STEM uh, interested people like ourselves. So that's kind of my STEM journey in the 10,000 foot view level. <laughs> you know, nothing like Dr. Burns there, but you know. So. No, let me tell you, let me tell you, first of all, the positions that both of you are in, you cannot be mad at it at all. Right. And second of all, the stereotypes that you both fight every day by being who you are within your careers, your families and so on, top tier, right? Like you are, you're breaking so many stereotypes. I'm, I'm glad to know you. I am blessed to know both of you. So I can be like, you know, I know you believe this, but I have two examples, at least two examples of the other way or the other opinion on that, right? I love that. Love both of your stories as well. Yeah, and uh, I just, let me add, I think a lot of people in our generation know uh, a different world, but did yeah. not realize the job and what he went to school mm -hmm. for, the job that Dwayne actually had going out of school. So for you to mention it and to remind us, 
that this that he went into electrical engineering. Like that's mm -hmm. a prime example of media showing us a black man going into STEM that's not highlighted, right? right? So I appreciate you bringing that up and saying, yeah, you know, it was all great with him flipping them glasses, but that man got a degree in electrical engineering. Like right. he was definitely. I just, just want to say I knew it from the beginning. I just told one of my friends in my organization a few days ago. I said I had a crush on Dwayne way back in the day, and she was like. Dr. Jones, I thought you had better taste. I didn't care about the flip glasses. <laughs> I mean, had it in order. He had it in order. He was raised right. He had a good career, education, and then wanted to give back. All right, I'm good. <laughs> and he oh, yeah. had a mama that didn't play. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. She didn't play. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't play. But I mean, I like the fact that, you know, one of the reasons that we do the show is to show um, the next generation opportunities that's in STEM. So going to get your PhD and doing the work in materials, which really isn't talked about a lot, as well as going to get your degree in engineering, but working in the business with it, right? Doing contracts, doing stuff like that. A lot of our youth don't realize that you don't have to be in a lab with a lab coat, or you don't have to, you know, be on a computer the whole time or whatever the case may be. There's so many opportunities when it comes to STEM. So, you know, thank you both for showing us two versions of it and what you can accomplish with going into those fields. So, you know, Absolutely. kudos, you know, I'm not going to clap <laughs> the sign language clap, you know. I was joining you, Kat. I had right, to right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> but this, we're talking about STEM and we're talking about parenthood, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And so one of the things that's come up in previous conversations when it comes to parenthood is planning. So was uh, parenthood going into parenthood, right? Was it a plan or did it happen? So, Dr. Burns. <laughs> yeah, so um, it, it was not planned. Um, so my twins that I have were an accident. They were not a mistake. I like to say that. So I had him first year grad school. And I usually tell people, you know, that's that's really the best time to have him in grad school. You really have the ultimate flexibility on your schedule. Mm -hmm. No one's telling you when to be in office or anything like that. And so it was the best time to have him. Um, once, I, I can say we, we were ready for it when it came. We weren't ready for it when we got the news. Because the news was shocking, but as soon as the kids came, it's like, okay. Now we got to put some things in motion. We got uh, seven months from today to get things in order from the time we found out she was pregnant. Well, okay, now we got seven months from today to get things in order. And let's do this the right way. Let's let's go ahead and start buying stuff. Let's go ahead and set up a room and stuff like that. So, you know, it worked out. And that's why I say it was an accident, not a mistake, because I wouldn't trade them for the world. And I love that. So you basically just went with it. Yeah, you got to. <laughs> We did get that same response last um, podcast interview, right, Kat? One of the gentlemen there said they kind of just, they were, it was reactionary rather than uh, mm -hmm. anything else. So that, okay, okay. And Marlon? And I'd say the same. Uh, it wasn't a plan, but uh, when we got the news, you know, we are ready for it. That was, I would say, the best accident that ever happened. And my wife is also in STEM, too. So uh, she works with the CDC. So, uh, she has the doctor title. I decided after the, the uh, NBA that I was done, you know, but uh, so he has, uh, my son has uh, both parents in STEM. So uh, for us, it was it was definitely big on, okay, we got the news. <laughs> it wasn't a what are we going to do with stuff. It was, all right, let's get ready. Let's find, you know, the best doctors we can here in Atlanta. And uh, let's go ahead and start getting ready so that way we can welcome our son with love. And, you know, we did. And, um, it was it was amazing. Now he's a big boy, almost five years old now. So, so precious, right? And that that's cool because you know a lot of times it's hard, especially for Black women or women in STEM to plan to you know maybe have to step away, and it's, it can be different for fathers. Not saying it is completely different, but sometimes it can be different just on. Uh, how society feels the woman should step up versus the man stepping up. So how do you feel about stepping up, stepping into fatherhood and being a father and a worker 
Like, how did that mesh with you two? Right. And we can start with Dr. Burns again. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, there is a stigma that uh, if a man and a woman have kids, it's more of the woman's responsibility than it is the man's. Um, I, you know, I went into the situation, I wanted to be incredibly hands on with my kids. I wanted, I knew that I, I worked hard because I needed to work hard in order to get the degree, in order to get right, you know, for my family going forward. So I worked a lot, but when I was there, I wanted to be present. I wanted to spend time with them. I wanted to play with them. I wanted to make sure they know who I was and what, what's my responsibility with them. You know, what should I teach them versus what your mom should teach them, so on and so forth. So I, I, I think it worked that way. Um, but my, my kids were wonderful the whole time. Um, like I said, I had twins um, born at 27 weeks. So they were preemies actually. Uh, my girl came home, she was about one pound 10 ounces. Well, they, didn't, they were in the NICU actually, they didn't come home, but she was one pound 10 ounces and my son was two pounds three ounces. And so the beginning of that parenting journey was like me providing support. I, I was super, super confident I was like, we got the best doctors here at the University of Florida. They're going to figure this out. We're going to be good. They've told us all these stories about all the kids from like 27 weeks that they stayed in the past. And they said, hey, we're going to do it. I said, I trust you guys. And so, um, but they were under a microscope the whole time, right? Because they're in the NICU. Doctors are just trying to find everything wrong to make sure that everything happens the right way. And so every time they're informing my wife, you know, maybe she gets upset or a little sad saying, oh, there's something wrong with them, something wrong with them. Is everything going to be okay? And so I was the support system for a while. And so eventually when they came home, it was like, okay, now we're 50-50. We didn't want to put them in daycare too early. In Freemans, they were a little bit more susceptible to contracting disease and stuff. And so I was pretty much home full time for like the first year they were there. And I would go to the lab at night. And so that was probably the roughest part of it, to be that beginning journey that we had. But we made it through. Um, and so here we are today. Wow. I, yeah, OK. <laughs> I didn't even guess that. So that is that's definitely a way of trying to accommodate, you know, making sure that you are hands on and there and supportive. So I'm, I'm glad you did it. Um, thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that, because I think a lot of people don't think of that option, right? Because I think that's another stigma that comes with being in STEM careers is we don't think we have as many options when it comes to parenting and being in our uh, relationship or whatever else that's in our personal lives, right? Um, so that does definitely provide some of those options for those who are thinking about that. Um, Marlon, what, what is your meshed world look <laughs> like? <laughs> uh, it's, it's not... It's, it's, a, it's a little similar to Dr. Burns. So uh, just I had to make sure that I was hands on the entire time. So uh, even from supporting my wife, going to all the doctor's visits, uh, being attentive, uh, trying to be attentive to me, trying to read books, you know, being that it was my first child, and also being there through the whole process, the delivery, staying in the hospital with her, getting clothes, uh, holding the baby, um, doing the skin to skin, and um, when he had to have the UV light put on him for the Billy Rubin being low. You know, we have pictures of me doing that. It wasn't room for me to lay down. So I was in a uh, rocking chair that was pretty hard with my feet propped up on the trash can so I could hold my little guy. Um, but um, it was super important for my wife and I to make sure we were there. Um, and thank God my wife had, you know, she was able to take uh, a quite a bit of time away from the CDC that provided her time. My mom was able to come up. So the first uh, month I had to go back to work after my first like, two or three weeks off. Mm -hmm. um, and traveling was the hardest part because I wanted to be there for my son. But once I got back from the office, I was like, okay, we have to cut this traveling down. And you know, that, that really worked for us. So it would be during the daytime, she had a little guy. Once I got there, she would nap if she could, um, and I would just come in hands on. Uh, I look forward to coming right in, knowing there's going to be a fresh diaper that needed to be changed. And I was I was okay with that because it was time for me to bond with my son. And, uh, I enjoyed it, and I still enjoy it. So I'm still really hands on. So today was uh, taekwondo. Um, so I had to go to taekwondo today, and just being there as much as possible. Um, to support my wife, support my son, 
And so we do a really good job of balancing that. Being able to work from home has definitely made it a lot easier. Uh, so I can do drop-offs in the morning, pickups in the afternoons. So that way my son knows both parents have been there the entire time. So he won't have a part in his, his life or his memory that uh, dad wasn't there. You know, it was always mm -hmm. mom just holding his dad. So I, I'm, I'm like Dr. Burns. I have to be extremely hands-on. Uh, the same way I like to take with my career, I definitely am bigger at home than doing that with my career. So have to be hands on. That's amazing. And <clears throat> first, I want to say thank you to everyone who's watching this live. So just a reminder, you can put comments or questions in the chat. So I see Alon said hi. Hi, Alon. That was a long time ago. Sorry, I just said it. But thank you for joining us. And I really want to kind of ask an opinion question. Is something Marlon brought up that I... I think we don't talk about enough, which is the time off, right? So for men, you only get, what, two weeks, three weeks to bond yeah. with your kid and have time off. And I mean, actually for women, it's not much better as six weeks, which isn't mm -hmm. a great amount of time to bond with a, a child. So how do you guys feel about this short amount of time off when it comes to work and bonding? Yeah, so I think it's unfortunate because I think the kids should have just as much time to bond with the mother as they do with the father. I think everything should be equal, straight down the middle. And so you see that, right? It's a part of the stigma that we were talking about previously is that the woman is supposed to do more than a man. And so it's an unfortunate stigma. Maybe that was true 80 years ago, but I think times have changed now. Um, unfortunately, when I was going through the process, I asked my advisor specifically for time off. And she said no. Um, but remember, I just said that I did take a year off. It's because she didn't know when I was in the lab or not, right? So that was the beautiful part of it. I just got my work done. I reported back to her, and everything was good. She didn't know when I was in the lab and stuff like that. I wanted to take dedicated time off. Uh, she said no. I maybe if I was a woman, she would have said yeah. I don't know. I guess we'll never know. But yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's unfortunate. I agree. I agree. Um, I think the CDC is a little bit better than six weeks. I think you, you can average six weeks and then take a little leave and get an additional six weeks. Um, that was what my wife did uh, for myself. Yeah, it was, it was the two weeks, but I wanted to make sure I got that extra week. So I just put in that vacation time. But it is unfortunate uh, here in America that we don't uh, value the father being home uh, bonding with the child but also being support for the wife um being that she just went through a uh, traumatic experience um and i'm birthing and bringing life you know and then sometimes i'm sure you know my wife had to pick up my son and she was hurting uh, still a little sore um and i don't think that's that's a uh, thought and that's being considered but i agree with dr murray it should be split down the middle so that way you can have a really balanced um household you can be there uh, as a husband as a spouse a significant other to support um your significant other um because i mean outside of just the physical aspect it's still a psychological and mental aspect that you know mm -hmm. uh, women go through and a lot of times they end up going through it by themselves and then uh men come in and we don't recognize it right away because we've been away from it all day working so we come home and we immediately shift the focus to the child and no focus is really put on the spouse or the significant other. And you start having that breakdown if you're not really careful, you know, communicate well. So I definitely and agree. That I'm and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Marlon, because I was actually going to go there next with my question for both of you, which is on the lines of, you know, your mental health. Um, during all these things. Because I, I do believe, well, we all know that mental health is something important that we have to think about across the board, whether you're just a father without a job, a father with a particular type of job, um, or whatever else. But for a for fathers in STEM careers, um, from all the way from, you know, when your significant other was still pregnant to now, um, when you're thinking about your kids and, you know, if something you have a challenging day, what are those tips or tricks or you know the advice that you would give to other people based on what you've experienced and learned and how to help out your own mental health through all those parts of you know, your life? 
Yeah, so um, a couple things. Um, I know when they first came home, uh, there was on a schedule where they were saying, you know, feed the twins every two hours. Mm -hmm. And so that's tough, through the middle of the night, right? So you're just, you're waking up every hour, you're fixing food, you're trying to feed them, and then it takes a little bit of time to go back to sleep, and then you gotta wake up again, and it, it's, it's, it, it repeats and you never quite get enough sleep in. And so obviously that can affect your mental health. I remember me and my wife, we were, we were up in the middle of the night, every two hours, we're walking around, we're trying to figure out where the bottles are. We don't know which way is left, which way is right. And it was just crazy. But um, I think we, we uh, ended up talking to both of our parents and they were like, hey, you really don't have to do this regardless of what the doctor says, get some rest in. And so we took that advice and, and kind of ran with it. So we started doing it every four or five hours and that was way, way better than two hours. And so that was much, much better for our mental because we, it felt like we were going insane. I don't know how anybody did this, especially if you were on your own in the process. Because right? yeah. we had each other. But the people that's on their own and they followed that advice, that I, I can't imagine. Um, <laughs> but um, after that, um, I don't think I've struggled with any type of mental health or anything like that. Right now, it's more so of a consistent schedule. We have a park right behind our, our place that we live at. And so anytime I feel a little overwhelmed, I would go for a run. I get the kids out, they would run. And by the time they're back in the house, and I've made them run about half an hour to a mile, they're laying down on the floor saying, Daddy, I'm tired. And so you just got to find something to do that, that works for you and your family. And that's the best way to manage mental health. Some people is reading, some people, Let's watch cartoons, some people go for ice cream, some people exercise, just figure out what works for you. Nice. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I agree um, with that wholeheartedly, especially. Uh, it did get tough at times, you know, you're waking up in the middle of the night, you have to go to work, and the baby decides, ah, tonight I don't want to sleep, I just want to <laughs> cry. And then by the time the baby gets to sleep, it's five o'clock, you're getting up at six, you're going. And so, um, the, the biggest thing was for me is just keeping the main thing. The main thing was my family. So I knew my career, um, working hard in my career was going to pay off. But at the end of the day, you know, I'm really being a family first. And so that's what kept me in the right mental space. So even after a hard day at work, I could come home, see my wife, see my son. And just seeing that little, getting that first little laugh out of them would like erase all of that foolishness that happened throughout the day. And then if it did get to a time when it was tough, you know, for me, I'm not the runner like Dr. Burns, I'm the weight room guy. So I can go in, I can slam the weights, I can do whatever to those weights, and I can, you know, benefit my body as well, my health as well, and then, you know, get my cardio in and, and, and come home and um, play with my son and, and just be there and support as well. So, and now it's just a, like second nature, you know, I have my time to go to the gym. My wife has her time. She goes to the gym. And we alternate, you know, how we're going to make sure we take care of Mr. MJ. So whether it's today, you have drop off, I have pick up, or you have drop off, they have pick up, and it's all right, Taekwondo today, I have the gym. We, we seem to make it work. And that really balances us out mentally um, as a family has been throughout this journey. I mean, there has been, you know, your bumps and your learning curve because you know especially going into you know no kids to a kid right away it's uh it's definitely a, a really steep learning curve and you know i, I tip my hat off to uh dr burns because i, I had to do it one he had two you know so <laughs> you get one to sleep and then the other starts up and wakes the other one up I, I you know that that is you know that's something special that um that that he's went through and that he's done you know so um for me that that is the biggest way i've kept my mental health is just keeping the main thing the main thing family first i like that and uh you know god knows what he's doing he knows who to get one two and two to get. <laughs> oh yeah sure i only does. got one and i i'm glad um, <laughs> right. uh, we had a comment from steve saying great conversation appreciated by a father of two daughters and then we have a question from James saying, how do we get more black parents into STEM and recognize the value? And let me read, let me say that I know where James is coming from and what he's saying is parents who traditionally aren't in STEM, don't know STEM, 
you know, STEM is over their head, but maybe their kids are into it. Like, how do we get parents or who are not into STEM to be to recognize the value for their mm -hmm. kids? So I would say a lot of times there's nonprofits locally where you are. And so they will do like scientific, uh, scientific demonstrations for your kids. I think it's pretty easy to sign up, uh, go to the scientific demonstrations with your kids, a lot of them are hands on, building robots or doing bottle rockets and stuff like that. And then you start seeing what type of experiments the kids are doing. You're hearing from the moderators, what's the underlying science behind it. And you're soaking all of this in as a parent, right? And then you can start volunteering with that organization. And now you're explaining to the kids STEM and stuff. And so once your kids start seeing their parents explaining them and being hands-on and being actively engaged in these types of things, uh, they're going to draw more of an opinion towards it. And so I think that's one of the best ways to break the cycle, or start the cycle, rather, is to get involved in nonprofits, go to some scientific demonstrations, uh, and actively tell your kids to get involved in uh, some scientific art shows or poster competitions or anything like that. There's, there's a lot of avenues out there. Right. And like Dr. Byrne Brown, Brown said, exposure, exposure, exposure. Uh, exposure leads to expansion. So um, for me, it's, it's, it's doing the same thing. But when, if you already are blessed to have a child that is interested in STEM as a parent, you're not. Start putting some interest in where your child is. A lot of parents aren't interested in sports, but their children want to do sports or ballet, and they put them in there and start becoming engaged. So doing doing that is the easy way, like Dr. Brunch was saying, you know, sign them up for nonprofits. So even even a step back from, from that, you know, uh, you have so many shows that kids watch that have science experiments. You know, uh, one big thing with us was like, Bill not a science guy, you know, stuff like mm -hmm. that, and start doing those fun little things, you know, making the volcano, and then learning why does this work why is there a reaction what's the chemical reaction behind this or even from um my side of stem which is you know electrical engineering you know taking a potato and sticking probes in a potato and lighting a light bulb and then wondering you know why is there electrical charge and current you know and doing those little things you'll see your child light up and their mind start to to go um and doing that is the easiest way um as a parent to get into it and then once you involve and you see that your child has gravitated toward that you just continue to push them you know push them support them um sign them up for the competition sign them up for you know help help them with the the posters and and explaining what's going on help them with the research you know and make it a fun activity that the family gets involved in like anything else just like you get on the card and play uno with the kids or you can watch a uh, cartoon with the kids, you know, take some time out to also invest in learning with your child. So that way, not only is your child learning and excited, but you're learning as well. So you know what questions to ask your child and they can tell you, hey, this is why this happens, you know, this is why this current, you know, flows in this direction. And it's, it's something pretty awesome that happens, you know. I've done that with my uh, godson, Azabion uh, Mosley. Had to put your name in there just in case you're watching, Zay. Um, he's a sophomore at uh, FAMU DRS, but he's also uh, already at FAMU University uh, taking classes. And he is big into STEM. I still remember him coming home from uh, an engineering class. And this is in middle school. And we're writing on a napkin. Uh, it's a replacing Tallahassee called Genghis Grill. Um, don't have it anymore, but he likes Mongolian uh, beef, and he's in the anime, so I started picking up anime, so we can kind of have something to talk about, and we were drawing, uh, you know, a simple circuit diagram, and I'm like, man, I didn't learn this until circuit analysis in college, and you're in middle school, <laughs> and you're doing circuit analysis, you know, so that was one thing I got to push him with for um, buying him a robot, and that's building the robot together for Christmas. You know, and that was a way for me to actively show them that, hey, son, I got you back, you know, in STEM. You know, this is what you want to do. Let's do it and let's be the best at it. So. Now, I definitely think those are all great options and great ideas. And I'm going to do a shameless plug because for Kat, Bamino, and myself, we also are, if you look at our websites, we have nonprofits. We have, Kat actually has a, what is it, outdoor play day. And 
in Living <laughs> Science Day coming up in, is it in Oakland? Yes, Oakland. Yes. And it's mm -hmm. free. A lot of the things that we provide are all free resources, free exposure to STEM and STEM careers. You know, even having both of you up here, it's, it's exposing any individuals to your careers, but also taking it a step further and talking about a lot of things we talk at, at our kitchen tables about, you know, fatherhood for STEM, people in STEM and so on. So we have a lot of options that are available. So I, I, I definitely agree with everything that you're talking about, those nonprofits, that exposure, that mentoring aspect to it all. All those things are important, but I think the most important thing is at the end of the day, the initiative um, from a parent, because at the end of the day, when we stop talking to the child, we have to send them back home with their parent, right? So, you know, what they do behind closed doors at the house is what continues that exposure and continues that excitement and allows that kid to continue to live in that and hopefully pursue it moving forward. So I definitely agree with everything you're saying. So I had a question based off of what you all were just talking about. Um, and we have talked about this in some of the past sessions as well. So now that we're on this kind of topic of exposure and so on to STEM careers, um, do both of you expose your kids to, you know, your STEM career and how do you do that? Because we were talking about how important that is at the early age to allow your child to see what you do. What does dad do for work? You know, um, do you do you both actively participate in giving that exposure to your own kids and how? Yeah, so uh, me and my wife, we actually do take the kids to some of these nonprofit events that we've been talking up, that I've been talking up during this time. Uh, so we do go and do hands-on activities with the kids. You know, some of the, the small things, because they're, they're four. And so some of the things they understand, but it's more about having fun at this point, getting into the habit of going and doing this stuff so that they can see, and then we're explaining, and then eventually they'll start to grasp some of these concepts. Because it's, it's, we got to take baby steps, and then they'll get there. So we do do that. Um, I, I do want to get involved in things like career days and stuff when they start having them. I think that's more of an elementary school type of thing, more so than it is daycare. Because um, the, the, the kids have short attention spans right now, and maybe we'll come in and they just won't listen to us. But yeah, 100%, I'll be involved in, in something like career days. Uh, bring your kids to work days coming up in a month. So I'm going to get to bring my kids to work, show them around what I do, uh, let them meet my colleagues, and hopefully my colleagues spark inspiration into them. Because sometimes they may get tired of hearing the same old person trying to spark inspiration into them, which mm -hmm. would be me and their mother. And maybe they just need a different voice every now and then. So they hear other passionate voices about STEM. I think it'll work out for them. So all of the above. Yeah, and I agree. At, at this age, it's a little hard to get him to focus. Um, but you do start doing other things. Like for my son, he's always interested in why does this work? Or I got to plug this in. So for, for us, it's just something simple for us. Okay, let's plug in the light. Let's screw in the light bulb. Or, you know, let's change the batteries out. Why do these work? Why do these not? And he'll tell you, oh, these are dead. They don't work. And most of the time, it's, Dad, it's not working. Can you change it? You know, is what, what he he does, but he starts seeing me do things, um, you know, doing things with the drill, doing handy type work and changing out things. So now he has, you know, a little tool kit and he has his drills. So he's like, dad, I'm like, you I have drills. I want to help, you know? And, and so he, he does those type of things. So that, that like at the, the foundational level is how I'm getting him kind of into uh, those things as well. Um, and so he does start recognizing and seeing uh, the different things. So I know once, you know, he's in elementary school, career day happens, and we're able to start, uh, take your child to work days. And then that's when the, the real magic gets to happen, where he gets to, to come and, and sit and see us do things. But we do take him to like little museum type things or uh, even little aquarium days or stuff like that, that that's uh, geared toward the kids that we can take them to so we can kind of you know get them into that stem field and uh also the science the science portion of it uh as my wife does um the community health portion so he's a he's he's, he's become like a little germ freak now so it's dad i don't have sanitizer in my hand so i can't put that in my, my mouth right now you know and it's, <laughs> no, that's right it's, it's, it's good that he does that he doesn't always do it but normally he's you know i just came from my side i need some sanitizer why? Because like, we have to kill the germs. Why? Because we don't need germs in my body. Like, so just kind of small micro level bites 
uh, getting them into it. And, and so we can see it piques his interest. And so it's now it's, hey, Dad, we got to go wash your hands. we got to go do this. Okay, now we have to go get our drill. And you can, you know, have pictures of him underneath the table like he's taking the table apart and putting it back together type thing. So uh, that that's how we've been able to expose our son at this age to uh, some stuff. And I, I want to go way back to something, Marlon, you said way earlier. Um, is that you went to college for football and then you went to electrical engineering, right? Yeah. But a lot of athletes don't look at going into those types of fields or to be quite honest, finishing college if they can get in the draft. So, you know, how how can we encourage those in athletics, parents and kids about saying, you know, you can do both, you know, you do multiple, you right. know, you can do sports, you can do STEM, you could do entertainment, you can do all kinds of stuff, but don't limit yourself to one. Right. Well, the biggest thing is um the parents being a good influence on the children, on uh, the kids going into college, you know, because once you once you're in a like in my case, a division one college, we were pushed to put athletics first, which is why I had to get okay. back my scholarship. Uh, so I had I, I ended up getting a scholarship and basically um engineering classes to um toward the under in part of my major um was taking me away from practice and it was you had to take this class he has to take this class and this class is in the middle of practice so he's going to miss practice today so it became well which one are you going to pick you know you have you have to pick one you can do both but you can't be on scholarship playing football if you're gonna you're gonna be missing so for me it was just the realization knowing that two percent you know one percent of all the college athletes playing football are going to make it to the nfl draft and then an even smaller percent of that one percent are going to make it to pension which you have to play four years so for guys that are in that space you know nfl is a national football league it's not for long because most people don't get in there for long you don't you're not there to you don't get your pension um so it's, it's really on the parents to start investing in the children and the kids to know that, hey, there's some options, but because all it takes for football is one hit, one hit and you're done, you know? And even in some cases, you just cut the wrong way and you're done by tearing your knee up and nobody's touched you. You know, my first knee, um, I tore on the fluke that a kid dug a hole in the football field doing a Bobby Bobbin camp and I happened to go on the field and run in my route and step in the hole and not tell my MCL, you know, and it, it's yeah. just those type of things. So it was those, those type of things that my parents instilled in me that, you know, you're more than just an athlete, you know, because back then it was more, you're a dumb job, you know, and for me, I love breaking that stereotype that, no, I'm an athlete, but I'm a scholar, you know, I'm a student. Um, because at the end of the day, you can, after athletics, you have to have something to do. And that's why the mental health space it's so hard for a lot of athletes because for 20 years, 25 years, some 30 years, that's all they did. You take that away from them, they have no clue what to do. They have all this build the progression of energy and nowhere to put it. You know, the lucky ones start finding out, hey, I can transition into business, into acting, or like, um, you know, the Pivot Podcast. I love those guys because they're doing a great job of that. Same thing with I Am Athlete, talking about the mental health part of it. Um, and that's the biggest thing is that the parents have to start getting in the, the head spaces of the children and telling them you can do more than just run the ball, shoot the ball, uh, hit the ball. Um, you, you're, you're more than that, or even in the acting space, you're more than just an entertainer. You know, you got a lot that's in you. God gave you that brain and use it. That's the one thing that's not going to be taken away from you. And then as far as encouraging athletes to finish because i'm a big person too that if you have an opportunity to go in the draft and really go in the draft go in the draft parents mm -hmm. please listen to me if your child has an opportunity to go in the draft and they are going to get drafted and they're really talk highly let the children go in the draft because more than likely they're going to make more money in that short time than they will coming out into a career but just make a deal with them you know to finish college because now the NFL encourages um, the the athletes to finish college because if they start doing a, a study 
that the teams that were winning the most Super Bowls had the most college graduates on them. So when the Patriots were winning, they had the most college graduates. And so they started encouraging that. So in the offseason, you will see uh, a lot of the athletes that want to, they go back and finish college. Uh, same thing with basketball. Like Chris Paul, he just finished at HBCU. Um, mm-hmm. like you had guys like Steve Young from um, the San Francisco 49ers. He was also a lawyer. You know, so it was encouraged for you to go back to college. And you just make that deal with them and make sure you make finishing um, a priority for those athletes. And that is how you do that. You know, let them know you're not quitting on sports. You don't quit in the, in the classroom either. They go hand in hand. So, right. I love that. And I just want to add make sure they take a finance class, mm-hmm. <laughs> make sure they know what to do with the money that they're getting. Um, so yeah, I mean, this whew, this hour is almost done. We got like eight minutes. We did have a, a, a question, if you can answer it kind of quick, which is, do you know any STEM careers that might be interesting to athletes or involve sports? And the first one everybody thinks of is kinesiology. I'll just throw that one out there. But anyone else, anything else? I'll say sports medicine. And now there's a uh, sports psychology. Um, and a sports psychology with performance, an emphasis on performance. Because it's one thing to have the mental health space, but it's another thing to try to break an athlete out of a slump because that's also a mental space they get into. Um, we hear it a lot with basketball players or baseball players getting slumped and they can't hit the ball or they can't shoot the ball. It's not that they forgot their fundamentals. It's just mentally getting past that roadblock. Sometimes it's coming off from the injury. Um, physically, you're ready to, but mentally, your mind won't let you jump, won't let you run into that person uh, like you were before. So um, that, that those are great options um, in the STEM portion. And then also, um, even from the engineering space, uh, now they have helmets that have air conditions inside the helmets and also have transmitters so they can tell how hard somebody's been hit and right away to know, hey, these people want a concussion protocol. So I think the, the air conditioned helmets at uh, LSU are, are, are going to um, demo those out this year. So. Oh, that's that's dope. And let me go back in that M, math, finance, physics, you know, you want to know, you want to have that money, learn well to use that money, go into the M, the math and, and get to involved. Um, but I, okay. I would be remiss if I don't point this out for my neuroscience people, that if you find the focus that you have a passion for, such as concussions in football, there's plenty of grants out there to allow you to actually focus your research on that in order to help NFL and NFL athletes to you know, improve their life and their living for longevity wise um, after being hit so many times on the field. So, you know, it's all in how you connect it as well. Right, right. absolutely. younger too. Um, look at Dr. Myron Rowe. Uh, he is a, yeah. a excellent mm-hmm. example as a neurosurgeon, former uh, NFL, um, Cambridge scholar, all of these things. Um, and him seeing the importance of, you know, getting a concussion protocol after certain hits, because not only did he experience it, now he knows what's going on behind those hits as well. And if you watch him, sometimes he'll do a play-by-play breakdown of the game. And it's like, he needs a concussion protocol. That hit, and he'll break it down. He'll break down the science of it. Like with that amount of force and that jarring, he should have been in concussion protocol. So, and now the NFL is starting to recognize, and some of the sports uh, world is starting to recognize him in that that vein. But at one point, he was shunned for that. He was almost blackballed for that. So, all right. Um, so we in the last five minutes, and we can start with Dr. Burns. Um, just is there any last thing you want to add, as well as if you're comfortable, if anyone wants to get in contact with you, either like a social media, a handle, a LinkedIn, whatever you want to give to let the someone who might want to talk to you further about material science or whatever, get in contact with you. Yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to add, I guess, is probably the most important thing that needs to be said today is that we have to invest in you. And everyone knows that we do. I just want to emphasize that point more. And for someone like me that's working in university, a lot of times when kids get to university, sometimes we lost them already. And so even if you're working in university, go back into your community, go back to the middle schools, the elementary schools, the high schools, 
then go and talk to the students, right? Be hands-on with them, uh, tell them about what you do, and, and talk to them about avenues to success and pathways to get to where you are. Because it's so important for them to see you and see where you are, so now that they know that they can get to where you are and even do better than that. So that's super important. Um, if you want to get in contact with me, there are a number of ways. LinkedIn, um, my name is Corey Burns. I think you can see my name on the screen that you're looking at. So yeah, you type that in. Uh, my email, coreyburns at virginia.edu. Um, yeah, get in contact with me one of those ways. You want to hop on the chat, let's talk a little bit, uh, give me a call, something like that. Uh, feel free. Awesome. Thank you, Marlon. And I agree as well. Um, investing in the youth is um, investing in our future. You know, without our youth, there is no future. Um, so that is super important um, for fathers, mothers, um, uncles, aunts, grandparents, investing in your, your youth, investing in your kids. Don't wait until they're 18 to decide to try to invest them and push them. In. What do you want to do? It's our job as parents to um take care of my investments and grow our investments our children are investments so think of it like an investment you know you don't just let an investment sit and go bad you don't let it run all the way out you, you can see that it's going down the wrong path you snatch it out of that fund and you make sure that you you're putting it in something else or this is that good ground that you've been given and you have a life in your hand so you know if you see hey this isn't working let's let's transition quickly you know so that way when they're 18 they don't have the saying I, I don't know what i want to do i don't have an idea it's no i think i want to go into this and then let them at least go to college with that plan um because sometimes you know the plan will change um i am uh you can find me on linkedin as well uh marlon napier n-a-p-i-e-r i know it says marlon auto uh audio uh but it was, it was supposed to be my audio i was trying to do two cameras at one time but marlon napier uh even um for social media, Marlon Napier on Facebook, on IG is Mr. Underscore Napier 22. That's Mr. Underscore Napier 22. Um, th those are the easiest ways to contact me. And, you know, I don't care what the question is. Um, or even if you just want your child to contact me, that's fine as well. Because for me, it's, it's all about giving back to um, our community and any community, but especially the STEM community. Well, thank you so much, Marlon and Corey, for being here, for sharing your stories, but also allowing me to be nosy and framing it as if this is a podcast that we will all learn from. But I really was just wanting to pry in your lives a little bit. <laughs> but no, you, you've been able to impart so much wisdom on all of us based off of your experiences. And we appreciate your mm -hmm. feedback and your transparency in allowing us to kind of have some tidbits and notes moving forward. So thank you so much for being here and I'll pass it to Kat to close this up. Yeah, uh, let me just echo uh, Dr. Tay. Thank you guys for being on here. Yes, this podcast is just a shameless way of getting to be in everyone else's business that's in STEM. So, you know, I don't mind sharing that detail. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you everyone who joined us asking questions, making comments. This podcast is on all major networks. So if you want to listen to it when it comes out, make sure you check it on any of in all uh the major networks and if you want to be on the show let me know send me a message i also i would love to uh, have as many people as we can on here telling their story of going into stem and living outside of stem so um thank you again for everyone and have a good rest of your wednesday bye everybody have a good good wednesday, everybody